And let's now move on to Ned Trask from Sandia National Lab in Albuquerque. Will present his paper, uh, Robust Training and Initialization of Deep Neural Networks from an Adaptive Basis Point of View. Thank you very much, Lars, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, so the, um, what I'm going to discuss today came out of a little reading group we have at Sandia where we were digging into the approximation theory underpinning deep neural networks. And our objective had been to understand what kind of convergence we could ever hope to get uh, out, of a, out of a neural network. Uh, so for the kind of applications we're interested in at Sandia, so science and engineering problems, um, that are kind of high consequence, high risk uh, decisions, uh, this is a big issue for being able to trust the kind of results that you get out. So the kind of universal approximation results that uh, everyone's probably familiar with only tell you something about convergence and certain infinite limits, and they don't tell you um, how convergence depends on choices like the architecture size, the width, the depth, the amount of data that you have, um, or the optimizer that you're going to use. So it, it leaves a lot out. So there's a lot of recent work which has been exploring the actual convergence rates and how they depend on these kind of things. And a lot of these uh, uh, these things work by making an argument where you try and emulate certain well understood approximation spaces like orthogonal polynomials, HP finite elements, um, uh, wavelets, and, and so on. Um, and so the, these works have shown that you can get uh, algebraic convergence like HP finite elements, but in practice, you don't actually see these kind of things. So you only, you know, you'll get a certain amount of convergence up to a point, but then you'll have order one errors and typically you know, you're, you're stuck with what you get. So the, that's what we're trying to uh, dig into in this work. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna target deep networks with uh, the following architecture. You have some sort of uh, hidden architecture, it could be whatever you want, a dense network, a convolutional network, uh, anything at all. And then at the end, it's capped off with a linear layer. Um, and we're going to try and understand how this works for regression tasks and try and demonstrate convergence with respect to width or depth. And so neural networks admit an interpretation um, as trying to fit a nonlinear basis to data. Uh, so over the course of training, these hidden layer parameters, uh, this is well known, uh, are basically fitting an approximation space. And then this linear layer, its job is to find the best representation of that data-driven basis, if you will. Uh, so what we're trying to do, we're solvers people, we're finite element people. So we think about this as we want to squeeze the most as we can out of that basis. So that's going to lead us to develop something that we're calling a least squares gradient descent optimizer. And then from that perspective, it's natural to ask, um, how can you make that basis as expressive as possible? So during initialization, you want to maximize uh, the, the dimension of the, the range of that basis. So to do this, we've introduced what we call the least squares gradient descent optimizer. And the idea is you take um, you take this kind of generalized regression loss. So this can incorporate things like traditional L2 regression, but also physics informed neural networks and so on, uh, where these script Ls are uh, linear functionals of your neural network and the data that you want to fit and some training parameters. And the idea is if you take this chi, which is all of the weights and biases and the hidden and the linear layers, and you break it up so that you have the, the parameters for the linear layer, this chi L, and the parameters for the hidden layers. If you freeze the hidden layer parameters, what you extract is a least squares problem. Uh, so there's, you know, there's some older works in this direction. This isn't a particularly profound or difficult idea, but uh, with current architectures and libraries and uh, things like that, um, this lets you do the following scheme. So you can go into TensorFlow or whatever you want. You use automatic differentiation. You, you use all the, the nice tools that are available and you pull out this least squares problem. You solve it at each iteration of training. Uh, that gives you an optimal selection of these linear layer weights. And then you take a step of gradient descent on the remaining parameters and you go back and forth. Uh, so in practice, this is only about twice as expensive uh, per iteration um, in, a, in kind of a straightforward serial implementation. Of course, there's a lot of details there. But the really power, powerful thing about this is if you consider the manifold of optimal solutions or optimal fits of this adaptive basis to data, 
what this does is it, it takes your initial guess and it projects you onto that manifold. And then over the course of training, you're evolving so that you're always, you always have an optimal representation of your data in terms of your basis. And, and that has big payoffs. So I'm just gonna give a broad overview of the kind of results that we got. You can look to the paper for details. Uh, if you look at regression tasks, so in this case, we're doing 1D regression of sine two pi X. Uh, in general, um, using this optimizer, you get 10 to 100 times better accuracy with 10 to 100 times fewer iterations. Um, so, so that's a, a huge boost in performance. Uh, if you look at these kind of physics informed neural networks, uh, like the Kino George Karniadak has presented and some other works, you, you'll see that these methods using neural networks to solve PDEs, th this is a solution to the transport equation in uh, space time with a 10 function initial condition. What it does is it, it's trying to take the basis and adapt it to the, the streamlines of the solution. Uh, and eventually it'll, it'll get to a, a good answer. Uh, but if you look at, um, running it with this optimizer, it just immediately snaps into it. So it really, really makes a huge difference in terms of quickly adapting this basis to data. Um, and so for some 1D regression problems, you can see that you're able to actually reproduce uh, the, the algebraic convergence rates that, you're, uh, that you might hope for with neural networks. Now, the, the issue with this is that um, it really comes down to the initialization. So this, the way you initialize that neural network um, there's been some work from Jin Chao Xu's group that for a ReLU network, for example, um, this has an equivalent interpretation as a piecewise linear finite element space. And so you can think about when you're initializing a network, you're saying, where am I going to stick the nodes of that network? And in this example down here, we're initializing so that the nodes correspond to a, a Cartesian, a, a uniform uh, initialization. And over the course of training, it'll cluster uh, the resolution near features like in this example, a, a jump in the solution. But if you initialize your, uh, your mesh, this implicit mesh that's hanging in the background, if you, if you initialize it poorly, then it doesn't matter. You basically have basis functions that are out of the mix. Like they're, they're not even involved in this fit. And, um, and so what we'd like to do is figure out how, uh, how to remedy that. So in this cartoon, we're just gonna look at a little example. And the idea is that you have uh, a dense network which maps one scalar variable to two outputs. And the way to read these cartoons is at each layer, I'm plotting the output of the two neurons um, for each layer um, with the x-axis corresponding to the output of the first and the, uh, the, second ac the, the second axis corresponding to the output of the second neuron. And so um, what you can see is from, neuron, from layer to layer inside the network, that's a map from R2 to R2. And what's happening as you progress through this network using, for example, like a, a GLORA initialization is that um, the, the range of each layer kind of collapses, right? And of course, we're, we're putting in a scalar, right? So we have a 1D input. And so our data actually looks like a 1D curve embedded in this uh, 2D subspace, right? And so if you look at GLORA and HE, what you can see is that as you go to more and more depth, um, the range collapses to a single point. So what that means is that in, init in initialization, you're losing all of the expressivity of this basis uh, that you've got, right? And so what this means is at the end of the network, if everything's collapsed to a point, that means that your basis, that both bases are effectively a constant, right? So that means that they're linearly dependent and what, what can you hope to resolve with that? So our idea or proposal is what we've, called the box initialization. And the idea is we want to preserve the volume of this map. So we want to make it so that uh, the, the unit hypercube maps to the unit hypercube, maps to the unit hypercube over and over and over again. Uh, so there's some details about how to do this in the paper for different networks. Um, the simplest case I'm presenting here is for a ReLU network. And the idea is um, you take your data, normalize it to a unit square, for each layer, you march from left to right. You pick a random point inside that domain. You pick a random orientation for a normal. And then uh, your ReLU function, you can bound, right? You, you pick the slope of this ReLU activation so that, uh, so that you map onto the unit square in the next step. It's not particularly 
deep, but you can work through this. And actually for resonance, you can do a similar argument um, mapping onto the unit square, the unit hypercube um, scaled by E, uh, which is kind of interesting, but there are technical details there. Uh, so what you can see is that on the left up here, we have this for a dense network, um, and then we have it also for a residual network. And so Glora and he, you can see collapse to a point, like I mentioned before, this box initialization preserves um, some linear independence in the basis as you go uh, to deeper and deeper networks. And so on the left here, this is zero to seven layer, or one through eight layers. Uh, on the right, there's a different scale. So this goes up to 128 layers. So this is a very deep uh, network. And so similarly, you can see that a residual network preserves some, um, some of the volume, but these two basis functions are still proportional to each other. Right? That, that's how to read that you're getting a line in this little cartoon, right? Whereas uh, for the box initialization, it's really, it's preserving the volume of this map and it's preserving linear independence. So if you turn back to regression, you can see this amounts to reliable um, notions of convergence with respect to width and depth. So on the left, if you just do a he initialization, as you go to deeper and deeper networks, what you can see is you get better answers after a little while, and then you get worse answers again. So you, there's no clear notion of convergence. Whereas uh, for this, with this initialization, as you go to more depth, you get a monotonic decrease in the minimum error that you're able to realize. Um, of course, this is still a lot shorter than what people, it, it's not as fast of convergence as what people have theorized in the approximation theory community. But from our perspective, this is a really important first step toward making this stuff robust. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to mention is that we have a recent paper um, that's up on archive, the links down here, extending this to classification problems. And the idea is you can do the same game, you can freeze the hidden layers of your network and just try and optimize the, the linear layers. Uh, but in this case, you have a nonlinear loss, right? So you can actually prove that um, for this problem, that nonlinear loss is convex with respect to the linear layer, which means that you can apply Newton-based methods. So um, in this case, um, there's similar stories. It trains much, much faster. Uh, so we call this nonlinear gradient descent. That's this black line. It trains a lot faster than stochastic gradient descent. But um, at the end of the day, you would see maybe a 1% or a 2% uh, increase in prediction accuracy. Uh, so it's nothing super drastic. Uh, but there are certain things that pop up. So one thing that happens when you're doing, um, we're basically, the, the main issue is that we're overfitting. So that this solver does too good of a job locking in to a minimizer and you're losing some of the generalization that's actually desirable for these things. So we're excited about this in terms of explicitly in the future, uh, explicitly introducing regularization and so on and seeing if we can, you know, not only train better, faster, but also get um, for, for long-term training actually get a more dramatic increase in accuracy. I'll, I'll just point out one last thing is for these, for this PEATS classification problem, which actually came from a paper by Lars, um, if you look at the basis functions that get pulled out by this method, they're wildly different than what you, um, than what you would get during gradient descent. So you can see the basis functions down here, gradient descent. You're trying to learn some classification of these kind of ovular, um, sets in 2D, and you get this kind of discontinuous um, set of basis functions that you're trying to find linear combinations over and, and build a score or a probability distribution for in, in these classes. This process actually trains very differently. So you get much more regular functions, which at the end though, are still giving you a sharp representation of these class boundaries. And you can see at least for this problem, this is a problem where we did see dramatic increases um, in accuracy uh, you, you get a qualitatively different and better prediction. Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. I'll, I'll make a pitch. Um, we're actually looking to hire postdocs uh, starting this fall for doing some data-driven modeling and physics preserving architectures and, and so on. So if you're interested, please, uh, please shoot me an email at this address. Uh, thank you very much. So then I have uh, a question for Ned. Um, if you, if you can go ahead and meet yourself already. Um, so there were two questions that I'm going to mesh into one. Uh, they both uh, relate to the box initialization. Uh, 
So one question was, uh, will the weights uh, throughout the network be correlated or would they be independent? And the other question was, if, if, if that performance that you showed, the performance increase, if you looked into how this uh, scales with uh, dimensions of the inputs, or I would add also to the width of the network. Mm -hmm. uh, so regarding the, the first one, um, they're initialized independently, uh, which is interesting because there have been in the last year or two, a couple works that I'm aware of where um, uh, incorporating some sort of dependence in the sampling for the initialization is actually a similar path. Uh, so the, uh, that's kind of a distinction to what we're doing. Uh, with respect to performance, there's, um, I guess, depending on your background, performance can mean two things. So in terms of computational performance, this scales trivially. Um, you could do this for as big of a problem as you want. Um, but I'm assuming it means the, uh, uh, the actual accuracy that you get out of the initializer. Um, and with that meaning, it works perfectly fine. And, and maybe th this is kind of some of the intuition about what makes it work is this is just the initialization. You're going to go on and train. So as long as you initialize it so that all of the basis functions are in play, in the first iter iteration, you immediately do a least square solve and it locks you into a good approximation. And at that point, like your entire network and basis is activated and you're moving along that manifold of good approximations. So there's nothing about that that actually depends on the size. And, and that's maybe one of the, the key ideas about what makes this stuff all pulled together. Okay, and I had a naive uh, follow up to that. So the zero one does not come from the domain, does it? It's completely independent, right? Yeah, the zero one, I mean, you could go through this and, and tweak it. We just, for the sake of uh, uh, simplicity of presentation, we normalized all the data to zero and one, but you can do the same thing on complex, oh. uh, I mean, compactly supported domains, but um, yeah. 